Hey everyone, it's John Buck back with another video for Discrete Time Linear Systems. Uh, in this short video, I'm going to review some important properties of the unit impulse function for continuous functions, uh, sometimes also known as a delta function or the Dirac delta function after the physicist Paul Dirac. Um, we're going to be using this a bunch for, particularly for Fourier transforms of periodic signals. Uh, so I thought it was good to just do a short video recording some of the important properties we will be using about this function. One of the, the, the in, different things about this function uh, is that we don't really need to know what it looks like. All that really matters is what it does inside an integral, how it behaves when you're inside an integral. Uh, so I'm going to go over those properties now. So again, our uh, topic for today is properties of the continuous impulse function. Um, and so uh, the continuous time we're just going to call it the continuous impulse function. We're actually going to be using it in frequency more than time. Let the Fourier transform. Uh, so we often write this as, we'll write it as delta of omega as a function of frequency. And this is a function, we say that delta of omega is infinitely tall, infinitely narrow, and has area 1, which is actually the, the first important property, remember, is that if I, is this unit area property, which says if I take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of delta of omega, d omega, that's finding the area under the, the delta function, it will be 1. And we often, for this reason, we can't really graph it, because how do we make something infinitely tall and infinitely narrow? But we sort of represent it by an arrow, in this case at zero, uh, and we write the area sometimes in parentheses next to it. Put it in parentheses to remind us that's an area, not a height, because the height is infinite. Uh, the second property that we'll use a lot is very important in Fourier transforms is the sifting property. And what that says is that if I take an integral we can put the delta inside an integral. And inside that integral, I multiply it with another function we'll call f of w. What it does is it just sifts out that one value of the function, that I get the value at f of 0. And again, thinking about this thing that's infinitely big at the origin, if this is my, my uh, delta of omega, and then maybe I have some other function going along and it's scaling it, well, at, at just this point, at this infinitely narrow point at the origin, the height gets f, you know, this is my, my f of omega. Then it gets f of omega times bigger. So instead of just having area 1, the height just got scaled by f of omega. So this makes sense. But why we call it the sifting property is that in practice, we often end up using this with a shifted version of the impulse. So that if the impulse function, say I move it over to some value a, Right? This is a, a shift in frequency, still multiplying by f of omega, d omega. It's now moved over, and it's pulling, it's sifting out, is why we call it the sifting function, the value of the function at a. Right? I've, if I sort of sketch what I had above here, right? f of, this is delta of omega minus a has been shifted over, so the, the pulse is now at located centered on a. And so now it's pulling out a different value of the function, or that's why we call it sifting out. And, and particularly, uh, to sort of give a, a small spoiler, the way we're going to use this a lot is if we put this into a Fourier transform. Right, if I have a function x of e to the j omega, so that the, I, the Fourier transform that is, we'll call it the shift omega naught now. So it's an impulse at omega naught. And I put that into the Fourier transform, inverse transform equation, rather, I'm sorry. So I have 1 over 2 pi integral from minus pi to pi of x of e to the j omega, the omega. And I now plug this in for my x what I'll get is that x of n is 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi, 
of delta of omega minus omega naught. Oh, I forgot a really important thing here. This is e to the j omega n. I'm sorry. So yes, the, the, the definition of the inverse Fourier transform should have this e to the j omega n in here. right? It's 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of x of e to the j omega, e to the j omega n d omega. So now I have something like this, where, where right, I have my impulse here, a shifted impulse, and this is my f of omega. So this tells me when this argument is 0 is when the value I'm going to sift out, right? The, the R, that the thing is centered at, well, in this case, it's been shifted to be centered at omega naught. When omega equals omega naught, the argument of the impulse is zero, and that's the value of f that just gets sift, you know, sort of magically pulled out of the integral. It's not magic, it's mathematical, but it, it's pulled out of the integral. And so this would be, I'd still have the 1 over 2 pi in front. But I have e to the j omega naught n. So this says basically the uh, Fourier, because the Fourier transform is unique and goes back and forth uniquely, this tells me that the Fourier transform of a complex exponential is an impulse. And then I just have to worry about the scaling factor if I wanted to write that uh, in a way we've, we've seen talking about the properties. I could say, if I bring that 2 pi to the other side, I could say x of e to the j omega n has a is a Fourier transform pair, a Fourier transform relationship with 2 pi times delta of omega minus omega naught. So complex exponentials make single spikes at, in frequency. It's just what sort of makes sense. This is a signal with a single frequency, and it has just one value, one place on the omega axis where it's not zero, where it has that, that big spike. We'll see more how to use this in different ways as we go on. Uh, but I, I just wanted to review again the key ideas that a, a continuous impulse has area one, and that has the sifting property when it's inside an integral with multiplying another function, it pulls out the value of that other function at the point where the argument of the delta function is zero. All right, that's all for now. I'll see you next time.